Ajiko Buken is a property where the former occupant died of unnatural causes such as suicide, murder, fire, or neglect. The word is comprised of the characters for accident, Jiko, and property, Buken. If you want to skip the intro to the scary stories, as I have gone over this before, please check the description box for a timestamp. But I think that this intro could be useful if this is the first time you've heard that phrase. These homes are also known as accident properties. These properties can be rented or purchased at very low prices, provided you are okay with the history of the home or the apartment. There are a growing number of individuals and companies that specialize in purchasing these stigmatized properties at huge discounts, and they either rent them out or resell them in the future. In the case of a house, the house may be demolished, and the land may be resold. Under the real estate transaction law, the real estate license holders have a legal obligation to inform the tenant or buyer of any known natural deaths that occurred in the property. The details of the accident must be also explained prior to the signing of the lease or contract. If the seller, landlord, or real estate agent intentionally omits this information from the rental or purchase contract, the contract may be nullified, and there have even been court cases where the contract has been voided. But before renting a Jiko Buken, let's look at the pros and cons. The pros are, these types of properties can be rented or bought at a very cheap price. The discount will be greatest for properties that were the scene of a violent crime or incident, and these properties may sell for less than a quarter of the market price. The cons, such properties may not be advisable for those who are concerned about uninvited guests, or believe in the supernatural or for those looking for properties that would be easy to resell or rent out in the future. But how do you find out if your property has a history? Well, the easiest and fastest way is to ask the real estate agent. You should try asking the building's management company. You can also check the popular Oshimateru website. That's www.oshimaland.co.jp. But please be advised that this site is not official and does not cover every property and every incident. So I want to give you a very quick example before we get into the scary stories. I chose an area that I used to live in, and I want to show you what it looks like when I pull up the website. So here's the mall I used to go to all the time. It has a supermarket, a food court, and a cinema, just really everything you need. As you can see, there's a flame mark here, and that indicates that an unnatural death occurred here. So let's find out what happened. So straight away by reading the first line, you can find out that someone sadly jumped off the top of the multi-level car park. And in situations like this, my thoughts always go out to the poor man's friends and family. We also have a comment to examine here, and it goes a little deeper into detail. But first, I want to show you the car parking area because the position of the flame doesn't really line up with the true area that the incident occurred. It's a little towards the back and it's in a bit of a darker area. Here it is. I will just give you a brief rundown of the comment that I found here as well. So the man in question was a 24-year-old teacher. He was suspected of some sort of road incident, drunk driving maybe, and the following day was his final day. Apparently he left a note, but I'm not sure of the contents, but I can imagine. What a shame. The pressure and the stigmatism of his violation on the road, potentially affecting his work and social life, probably motivated his fatal choice, according to the comment, of course. But I hope at this point we are now accustomed to what a Jiko Buken is. Here's another example, just a little up the street from the mall, there was a fire here, clearly, and unfortunately some people died, and therefore this has become a home, or an area with a history. A famous example in cinema, Perhaps is The Ring or The Grudge, if you've ever heard of those movies. You kind of get a flavor of a home with a history, you know? So, no further ado, let's dive into some true, disturbing homes with histories. 
aka Chico Buchan, aka Accident Properties Stories. I will be cutting in now and then to explain things where possible, and I really hope it doesn't disrupt the pace of the stories. But anyway, please can you do me a massive favour and drop a like, a comment, share the video, or subscribe. This happened in an apartment I used to live in. It was a long time ago, but something I'll never forget. I don't know why, but for some reason I always ended up feeling so tired in that place. I had a fair few experiences where I suffered with sleep paralysis. Sometimes I knew when it was coming. You know, I felt this strange sensation almost crawl all over my body, and I felt my body succumb to it. It was horrible. I have only told my closest friend about this, and it might make me sound like I'm utterly insane, but I don't care. I would wake up unable to move, and then I would see a figure stood by my door. Oh man, I'm getting those goosebumps right now as I type this. That figure, it was in the shape of a human, but it had an incredibly disturbing quality to it. From the neck down, it had human-like skin, you know normal from what I saw. The weird thing was the fact that I couldn't ever make out its face. It was like it was always obscured. It was always blanked from my memory, like a beep that covers a swear word. It was simply not there. The outline was fuzzy, but I would say that he, and I'm sure it was a he, always had a black kind of visage covering his face. It would come into my bedroom after materializing by the door, wrap its cold fingers around my neck, and start squeezing. It got tighter and tighter. The first time this happened, I was so scared and in pain. I felt as if I was fighting for my life. I wanted to get away, but I couldn't move, not even an inch. The only option I had was to fight with what little capacity I had. I just started saying to myself over and over, I won't give in, I'm not gonna lose, stuff like that. Every time I believed that I was gonna break free, I felt its grip tighten. From that night onward, it got worse and worse. The horror had begun. The next night, the same sort of thing happened, and by the time the sun went down on the following evening, I realized that I couldn't stand being at home when it was dark. I became frightened to sleep. I stayed out a couple of nights, but then when the weekend was over, I needed to go home. I needed to get a change of clothes, at the very least. I also had that attitude in me of, I'm not gonna lose, but I put off going home from my friend's place for so long I ended up going back just after sundown. And when I got home, I noticed that there was a change in the atmosphere in my apartment. It felt heavy and oppressive, as if it had been waiting for me to return. I tried to play it cool, almost trying to trick the apartment into believing that I didn't care. Do you see why I said I was going to sound mad now? I heard the sound of the door buzzer. I went to see who was there, and when I opened up the door, I realized that no one was there. When I opened the door and I looked down the hall, I heard the shower turn on in the bathroom. I got so freaked out, I got straight on the phone to one of my friends. I just wanted to speak to someone. He allowed me to stay over at his place. We had been friends since school and I really needed his help. Before I left my place though, I knew I needed to pack some things. I was really worried about going back in again, but something had to be done. I needed some work clothes, at the very least. I was panicking. As I was panicking, I heard a voice. It was incredibly faint at first, but I heard it, and I made out the words that was being said. It was saying, it hurts, it hurts. It might have said help me at one point too. I was so scared that I didn't even bother finishing packing. I just left with what I was carrying. I had to move out after that, I just had to. 
I called on my friends again for help. There was no way in hell that I could be in that apartment alone. That place was wild. I needed their help to help me move out. My two friends helped me pack, and one of them remarked on the heavy atmosphere. He even said later that he thought he heard a voice that didn't belong to me or my other friend. He thought it said, Don't go, please help. After I moved out and I got settled into a new place, things began to seem less stressful and scary. And at that point, I tried to find out what happened in that place I used to live in. I couldn't find much, but it was an accident property. I knew that much. A lot happened in there. I don't want to go into much detail, but think home invasion. Think why I couldn't see the guy's face. Think why I felt that strangulation sensation and the words that I heard. The shower being on when the doorbell rang, it all could be a part of it. I stopped reading into what happened. It was too sad and ultimately terrifying. The apartment building is gone now. I looked at it on Google Maps recently. I won't say where it is though, it's just a vacant lot at the moment. I never ever want to experience anything like that again. It was hell. I lived in a rental apartment that required me to be notified of its history before I started living there. What I mean by that is the real estate was legally bound to inform me of what happened in that apartment before I signed the dotted line. It happened about 20 years ago, and recently I've been getting into these online stories so I decided to share my experience. The reason I chose to live in a home with a history was simple. It was a lot cheaper than anywhere else in the location I wanted to live in. Just in case the rules are different nowadays, let me quickly go over what the definition was back in the early 2000s. When renting, if there has been a death in the property due to suicide, murder, or some kind of fatal accident, the new tenant will be notified in detail of what happened. Interestingly enough, they would do the same in other instances for what they called at the time, objectional facilities. Hi, sorry to cut in, it's Jay here again. Now, objectional facilities is an odd phrase, it's very vague, because it doesn't really give us much of a clue what it actually means, so I'll try to break it down a bit, based on what I've read. An objectional facility would be one of the following. Funeral parlors, industrial waste disposal facilities, known hotspots of criminal activities, and adult <clears throat> entertainment establishments. Back to the story. In my case, the apartment I wanted to rent didn't have that much of an interesting story. An old woman lived there and sadly, she died alone. To me, it seemed like a really peaceful death. Dying due to old age isn't a terrible way to go, to be honest. Apparently, she died at the age of 90. I didn't see any good reason why this would put me off living there. I didn't think that I was about to rent someplace haunted, so I signed the dotted line. I remember me and the real estate agent were smiling and kind of joking around as I'd signed. I was certain that I was getting an absolute deal. I ended up moving out after two months. I think you would too. Let me tell you why. That apartment was seemingly always full of stale, humid air, and there seemed to be a constant maggot infestation too. It wasn't just that though. If I left something on the floor for a while, for instance my bag, I had a satchel, it would start growing mold within a couple of days at the most. It was the same with magazines and books, it was really gross. Food spoiled really quickly in that apartment too. I ended up relying on jerky, and when I thought that I could rely on that for a while, I came home one night to find maggots devouring the jerky. I had only bought it about three days ago. It was around that point I thought to myself, hang on, this isn't that normal, is it? I went to cancel my contract, and I spoke with that same agent who signed me up, and he said something weird, and to be honest, really unprofessional, when I told him about the maggots I kept finding. <laughs> I guess 
Maggot City people are pretty powerful, huh? And with that, he laughed. I'll never forget that. I asked him what the hell he was talking about, and he elaborated. The peaceful death that I had been told about, and that I thought the old lady who lived there before me succumbed to, wasn't exactly all it was made out to be. While it was true that she died of natural causes, the real estate agent failed to tell me how long it was before the body was discovered. She died during summer and her body went undiscovered for over a month. He said that that's what they call the prime rot period. And that phrase gave me a shudder. He said that was the point that the residents could smell it. I understood the maggots now. One night before I left, oh yeah, by the way, I had to wait to leave at the end of the month. I couldn't line up my next place in time, so I was just stuck there. Anyways, before I left, I was trying to get things in order for moving day. I moved some heavy piece of furniture out of the way to make room for the boxes I was filling in the living room. There was a dark stain in the shape of a person in the fetal position beneath it. And it was right by the area that I would eat and drink in. It was horrible. I think that they didn't even attempt to clean the place properly before they moved me in. I don't think they attempted to exterminate the pests either. So, I don't know if I was really haunted. Maybe just traumatized. Something's been happening, and it's related to my dreams. My family home is in a very rural area. It's basically at the foot of some tall mountains. All through our little town, there are fields and fields. We are surrounded by them. But my family home was up a steep road leading to the mountains. I don't know if many people can relate to this, but it's what I grew up with. I had a temple next door. Yeah, an actual temple. Other than that, I guess you could say that there wasn't much in my neighborhood. Once you go down the kind of plateau that our home was placed on, we were a few hundred meters up, by the way. There was a road, though, but walking up there was horrible. Anyway, if you went down that road, you would see streets and houses, but picture a rural area. The houses were scattered around. So, of course, you could imagine the road, or walk up to my family home when it was dark, or even or even during the evening, was a little bit creepy. Well, that's an understatement, to be honest with you. It couldn't be more eerie when it was dark. I used to hear the scuttle and cry of all kinds of animals and insects. I want to tell you about an experience I had one dark night at home. I was in elementary school at the time. I was in the lower grades, and I was still sleeping in the same room as my parents when this happened. I'm not embarrassed. It's actually not that rare in Japan. That night, I had a very strange dream. I was giving my parents some kind of passionate speech in the living room. I have no idea what I was saying. I have no idea why I was doing it. But isn't that the very nature of a dream? It's all over the place, right? One thing I do remember is, is that my mother was listening intently. I was reaching the close of whatever the hell I was talking about, and I was about to unleash the final point I wanted to make. It was at that point I said, so, when I left this great pause to lead into my conclusion, I even banged my fist on the table for dramatic effect, in the dream, of course. At that point, I heard a child's voice, and it called out to me from a closet I knew to be in the room behind the living room. I heard that child's voice, and I heard it say, Moikai. Hi, Jay here. That's what you would say if you were playing a game of hide-and-seek. It's what you would say if you turned away and you had finished counting. Kind of like, are you ready? Or something like that. Anyway, back to the story. When I heard that, I thought to myself, is someone trying to play hide-and-seek with me? In my dream, I spun around and looked towards the hallway where there was a closet. I looked at it for what felt like a second or two. And then a door to our storeroom, which was 
like a basement, swung open, and what emerged from behind that storeroom door was a solid black silhouette of a kid of about my age. A young kid. It jumped out and shouted, More yo Hi, Jay again, sorry. More yo means I'm ready in response to the hide and seek thing. Are you ready? I'm ready. That kind of thing. Back to the story. Then this pitch black humanoid mass ran at me. I couldn't move. Then, just as it ran at me, another one of these weird dark figures jumped out of the closet in the hallway I had walked over to. The two figures then cut a curve in front of me and raced down the hallway towards the guest room. In my dream, I chased those dark figures, but I didn't know why the hell I did that. Then, when I turned the corner to enter the guest room, I just suddenly woke up. I looked around the living room and saw that my parents were sleeping. The room was dimly lit. I thought, oh, whoa, it's morning. For some reason, the moment after that thought occurred to me, my heart started to beat like crazy. I felt like the dream wasn't over for a second. I thought, whoa, this has been a weird night. Well, I better go back to sleep and wait for mum to wake me up later. I closed my eyes and tried to drift off. Then suddenly my body felt as if it was no longer under my control. Cold sweat began to amass my forehead. I didn't know at the time, but it was sleep paralysis. I remembered my dream of those dark shadow people and my stomach began to tie in knots. I tried to call out to my parents who were sleeping close by, but I couldn't make a sound. It's like the words were stuck in my throat. I could hear the labored breathing coming out of me when I tried, but I couldn't make a sound. When I didn't try to scream or shout, I could hear the natural rhythm of my breathing. It was like listening to myself sleep. It went dark. I think I lost control of my eyelids. I felt my body suddenly jerk upwards and then back down to the bedding. I was then able to open my eyes and I saw nothing but darkness. I thought, hang on. It was morning a minute ago. I had no idea what was happening, and I was terrified beyond belief. I was able to move when I opened my eyes, and I raced over to my parents. I tried to explain to them what happened while begging to sleep in between the middle of them in their bed. My dad moaned about it being 2am or something, but then he turned over and went back to sleep. My mum listened intently, but I don't think for one second she believed me. I mean, a kid having a bad dream? It's not that unusual, right? Nothing else happened that night, but I thought about it the whole of the next day. The next night came and I woke up in the middle of the night again. I am not sure if that was down to nerves or something else, but I will say that I woke up feeling very scared. When I woke up on the second night, it was dark this time. I managed to convince myself that if I fell back asleep, I would be unable to move or I might even see those shadow people again. Now, I was a very stubborn kid, and I was kind of dumb. I needed sleep. I remember thinking, well, I just won't sleep tonight then. However, it was inevitable. I fell asleep the moment I stopped thinking about not falling asleep. I felt that the change was almost instantaneous. My body stopped moving again. It was different from what happened the night before. I knew I couldn't move, but this time I knew why. There was something on top of me. Or should I say, someone. The most horrible thing about the situation was whatever and whoever was on top of me was just kind of sitting on my stomach. And I knew it was happy about it. I knew it was happy. I could faintly hear something softly laughing. Then I was aware of another presence. This time, it was off to my left, it was close. It was laying down, as if it was sleeping. My parents slept to the right of me, so I only had this thing to the left. It felt as if that one was looking at me. Then the one on top of me was looking at me. I decided that I would close my eyes in an attempt to make them go away. I thought to myself that when I opened my eyes, I would be awake in a brighter room with no one but my parents for company. Then the second I closed my eyes, I heard something move to the side of me. And then I heard a whisper in my ear. Hey, hey, let 
Let's play. That's a voice I'll never forget. It was like a human's voice, but it didn't sound organic. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it sounded like an interpretation of a voice rather than a normal one. Like when you hear a robotic voice, something kind of uncanny about it. This one didn't sound modern like a robot, though. It sounded the opposite. It sounded old, ancient. I know I'm not making any sense. In that moment, I wanted to scream so, so badly. It was the worst thing. I've ever heard. Once again, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make a sound. Hey, let's play hide and seek. It spoke to me. I don't know, but for some reason I was reminded, in that moment, about a book I had read at school, about being scared of monsters or something. There was a phrase in that book, I think it must have been only a picture book, but that phrase was something along the lines of, Ghosts are afraid of strong people. So with that in mind, I replied to whatever wanted to play with me, in my mind as confidently as I could. I was all like, Hey, who'd ever want to play with you, huh? You better not come back here again, you hear? I'll never play with someone as creepy or as weird as you. I thought thoughts like that for as long as I could, until I wasn't afraid anymore. I had been told before if I chanted, like the Buddhists in the temple next door, I could stand up to anything, and that seemed to work. It was like whatever was around disappeared in the blink of an eye. I timidly opened my eyes and the room was bright all around me. I was shocked, but I thought that I had just had another terrible nightmare. And then I felt something reminiscent of the nightmare. I felt a dead weight on my stomach again. Something was on top of me, and this was no dream. I turned over just in time to not be flat on my back, and I ended up facing the left corner, lying on my side, the direction where I saw that other shadow figure. I froze in bed. This time I couldn't even close my eyes, I was just like a stone statue that had been knocked over to the ground. I couldn't move my gaze from the corner of the room. I was completely fixated on it. Then darkness fell on the room. I was frantically thinking in my child brain, no, please, it was light a few seconds ago. The darkness seemed to emit from the corner of the room, and I couldn't stop staring at it. And that was when I realized something. It wasn't the room that was getting darker. It was the darkness that was coming from the corner that was making the room darker by growing bigger. Out of the darkness, a shadowy figure shambled towards me. It swayed unsteadily as it moved. I heard it speak despite not seeing its mouth for the darkness, and it said, Sorry. When I heard it say that, my consciousness slipped away, because that was the last thing I remember. That was the last experience I had with any form of sleep paralysis for a while. It was as if there had been a change, and for that I was grateful. After a few days, I became so curious about what had happened that I ended up asking the head temple priest for his advice and interpretation. He was old and wise and I always looked up to him. Here's what he said to me. You may have been greeted by the spirits of Mr. whose children were victims in the great Kanto earthquake. Hi, Jay here again, sorry. This earthquake occurred in 1923 and claimed the lives of close to 150,000 people. Back to the story. Mr. used to live down there in the town. His children were probably swept away in the landslide when it struck. They never found the bodies, no matter how hard everyone searched, and no one searched harder than Mr. Bonk. It was never the same after that. Those children, even though they were never seen again, they do have graves. I know that what I've told you might seem scary, but it might make you feel a little better if you wanted to visit their graves. I decided that I wanted to go with him to see the graves. It felt like the right thing to do and it felt important to him as well. Their graves were covered in moss. They looked lonely. We stood before them and I joined the priest in prayer. Then suddenly, as we were paying our respects, the priest started to speak and what he said went something along the lines of this. 
I'm a year older than these two poor souls. They often came to play with me at my father's temple. On this day of the great earthquake, they probably came to visit me. That day, I had taken a detour. I walked the long way home with another friend of ours. These two, they were probably playing up in the mountains, waiting for me to come back. And it breaks my heart every time I think of my school friends, so I'll always miss them. If I'd have gone straight home instead of taking that detour, then slim chance they might still be here. I was so taken aback by what the priest was saying that I ended up staring at him. He had his eyes tightly shut and he was staring at the two graves. He looked up once, way up into the mountain above. He had this look on his face that seemed to say, what if? He then looked at me with tears welling in the corners of his eyes and he said, Ah, maybe those two you saw were looking for me. Maybe they've been looking for me for a while. I felt sorry. So sorry for them. I felt that I was really cruel to them when I said that no one would want to play with them. I mean, they've been waiting so, so long for someone to play with them. I guess that it can't be helped, though. They actually terrified me when I saw them. I wonder if the chief priest knows that they were waiting to play hide-and-seek with him that day, way up in the mountains. Sorry for the long story. I live nearby a university. There are a bunch of high-rise apartments there. I want to share with you what I saw in the apartment opposite mine. It happened about two years ago, one afternoon at about 5 p.m. From my bedroom window, I could see one of these apartments. We hadn't lived in that home long, but one thing I noticed was the curtains were always drawn in the apartment opposite my window. That day when I got home at about 5, I headed into my bedroom, and I noticed that the curtains were open in the apartment opposite. Moreover, the light was on. I thought that no one lived there, so it piqued my interest. I went over to the balcony to see if I could see what was going on in there. The balcony gave a better view of the apartment's interior. I wasn't ready for what I saw. I saw someone hanging from a rope. Their back was facing me but I saw a body suspended from a rope in the middle of the room by their neck. I couldn't deal with it. I had to turn away at first, but then I thought to myself that it could be a trick of the light, perhaps a reflection from another window making it look like something it wasn't. But no matter which way I looked at it, it looked like a person hung by their neck. It scared the hell out of me when I saw that. I really didn't know what to do. I thought of calling the police, but first I tried my dad, who thankfully came home from work early, so I had the opportunity to ask him about it. He said he'd come over to my place. While I waited for my dad to arrive, I called the police, and also the landlord. He knew the owner of the building opposite ours, and it was only fair that I tried to inform him in some way. Before I knew it, an ambulance arrived along with two police cars. The two officers asked to take a look from my balcony, and of course I obliged. But when they saw what I saw, and I asked my dad to come up and see and confirm, they told me it certainly looked like what we thought it was. One of the officers went downstairs and met a paramedic, and then together they headed towards the apartment building. Shortly after this, a minivan arrived and out stepped the landlord, who headed into the building. My dad and I went downstairs with the remaining police officer to take a look. They had closed the curtains as soon as they went inside, so we couldn't see inside anymore. My dad and I just stood there, waiting outside the building. And just as soon as the police and the paramedics went inside, they came back out. We were both shocked. I expected to see that yellow tape stuff being put up outside the building, but it looked like the police and the paramedics were leaving 
They were quickly followed by the landlord, who was apologizing over and over to them. The paramedics left, but one police officer approached me and my dad. I'm here to inform you that what you witnessed wasn't what you thought it was. And my dad said then to him, Oh, ap apologies for wasting your time, but to us it looked like someone took their life. I know, it looked that way to us too. But what was hanging from that noose was a mannequin. It was made up to look like a person, and it was pretty convincing up close, to be honest. The mannequin has also been plastered with some kind of religious talisman. It was purposely suspended from the ceiling by the landlord. And he assured us that the room will remain unoccupied for the time being. I was shocked. I think anyone would be. I couldn't understand why the landlord would want to do that. Was he deliberately trying to scare people? It was seriously weird. I couldn't help myself. I asked out loud. Why would he do that? The younger officer approached during our conversation. And when I said that, he looked at his older partner as if for permission to tell us. And the older officer then said, well, it's only right to tell you. I want to put your minds at rest. The landlord says that this time of year, on this particular day, things happen in that apartment. That's why he can never sell it. He has had tenants move out due to activity. One said they saw a man suspended from the ceiling from a rope. The landlord wanted to put the mannequin up there on this day to deter the spirit of a former tenant who took his life in there. Me and my dad were so confused and shocked. My mind was blank. It was the strangest thing I'd ever heard. It was like I was in a movie. The landlord was very adamant that doing this on the death anniversary of that former tenant is the only way to stop the activity. And legally, I can't really do much about that. I can't stop a man suspending a mannequin in an empty apartment. Me and my dad didn't have anything to say in response. It was the weirdest thing ever. After about two years, that apartment was gone. The owner sold it. I was in the area recently, and I believe they knocked it down, and all that's in its place is a convenience store. This happened when I was a university student living alone in Tokyo. I wasn't living a life of luxury. My apartment was pretty damn small, but I did like it. And it was the corner apartment of the top floor, so it let in plenty of light. I picked this apartment because the rent was considerably cheaper than any other apartment in that building. I knew why it was cheap. It was an accident property. A home with a history. I didn't care though. I'm the type of person who doesn't really believe in the paranormal. I trust in science and logic. So I had no hesitation when signing the contract. As soon as I moved in, odd things began to happen. It started with the kettle. It would just flick on by itself and the water would start boiling. It was pretty jarring to hear that late at night. Let me tell you, a couple of times I woke up due to the noise it made. I used to leave the kettle unplugged after use but I didn't always remember to unplug it. The kettle would never flip on if the lights was on though. It only did it when it was dark. I have to admit, it was pretty scary, but I kind of grew to live with it. I woke up one night unable to move anything but my eyes. It was a completely new sensation for me. I didn't know at the time, but it was sleep paralysis. I was surprisingly calm. Maybe that was because I didn't know what was going on. I just moved my eyes around the room. I had a floor chair and a kotatsu in the middle of the room. It's a little table you just put your legs under to keep warm when sitting on the floor. Some have electric heaters. Anyway, I looked towards that area and I saw the strangest thing I've ever seen. It looked like there were people sat in my chairs. But they didn't look like real people. They were like stick men. 
What I mean by that is they had outlines, white outlines. But they were in the shape of people. Very strange. When I saw it, I laughed inside. I just couldn't move my mouth. I didn't understand what was going on. It was all so weird. Then the next thing I knew, I was asleep. I guess I must have fallen asleep as I woke up and I saw the morning light filtering in through the curtains. I could freely move my arms and legs, so I just got up and got on with my day. It was around that time that I landed a part-time job working in an izakaya, which is a restaurant slash bar here. I had no complaints working late at night because of the weird goings on at home. I was more than happy to pick up a night shift, plus I was making some good money. Anyways, one night I came home from work and I noticed something. There were shoe prints on my door. It looked as if someone had tried kicking it in or something. I was there mumbling and complaining to myself as I opened my door. I turned around to see the reverse side of the door to check the damage. And when I did that, I saw the same kind of shoe print marks on the inside of the door. Those marks definitely were not there when I left for work. I got all my shoes out and I checked the shoe prints against what was in my room. I didn't own any kind of shoe like that. I didn't give anyone a key and I always locked my door. It was really weird and getting scarier by each passing day and night. I was getting really freaked out. I mean, I was about 20 years old, a female living alone for the first time in my life. I got so worried that I called my parents and told them what was happening. To be honest, I was beginning to think about moving at that stage. You can imagine my parents' shock when they heard about the footprints. They wanted me to get out of there straight away. And I agreed, to be honest. I began the search for a new place. I found somewhere new. It was a bit more expensive, but mum and dad offered to help me out a little, so it worked. When I was packing up my things, I heard something get delivered into my mailbox. It was just a simple letterbox with a cage. I heard what sounded like a huge wad of envelopes get shoved through it. None of the mail was addressed to me. It was all addressed to some woman. Her name sounded old, like she wasn't another student. Like she wasn't another student. It would be like getting mail addressed to a Dorothy or something nowadays. Apparently, she lived in that room years ago. I didn't get any mail from anyone, but the mail that was meant for me whilst I was living there. I don't know why the hell that turned up all of a sudden. I kind of wish I opened some of it now, just so I could tell you what was in it. It was a bit freaky though. I didn't want to touch it. I moved away after that. I just had to. I'm sorry if this story barely makes any sense or is different to the usual kinds of ones that are shared. I didn't really have a haunting per se. I just had a series of very strange but very true events. So I guess my message to anyone is, be careful of homes with a history, and be wary of a cheap price. Last year I moved home. I changed job when it was autumn. It was my sixth job change at the time. It wasn't working out. It didn't seem to ever work out back then. I had less than a month to find somewhere to live before my job change started, and it was in a new city. I didn't have that much time, but I managed to arrange viewings for five apartments that met my needs, and I was excited to see what they looked like in person. I knew it was going to be difficult, but at least I had a couple of options. One of the apartments I arranged to view was the one that my wife had high hopes for. She really liked it. The rent, the size, the age of the place, and the area that it was in all seemed great. We really wanted that one. It would be great for the new job too, a five minute walk to the station and work was only about a 30 minute commute away. It seemed perfect. We wanted that one, but I felt like I needed to see the place in person and check out the area. Plus, I had four others. 
to check out too. We were supposed to go and check out the apartments together, but I got some unexpected news. My wife was pregnant. I said that I'd go alone, so she could have the morning to tell everyone. You know, I scheduled the viewing for the apartment we wanted the most to be at the end of the day. My last appointment. Well, to be honest with you, I wasn't impressed with the first couple of apartments. They either made a mistake with the listing, or they weren't entirely honest with me. For example, the size of the apartment wasn't as described for the first one, and the second one, they said it would be a 5 minute walk to the station, but that was rubbish. It was more like a 25 minute walk at best. The other one was a bit weird. The photos on the website didn't match what it looked like in reality. It looked all modern online, but the apartment looked like it was still in the 80s in person. I didn't get why people couldn't be honest. It dampened my hopes for the final apartment viewing. I was getting a bit nervy. All our eggs were now in one basket. I couldn't believe how much time I had wasted. By the way, I had the same real estate agent on each apartment viewing. I'd really grown to dislike him by the time we got to the final appointment. I almost walked away. I hadn't ever experienced this kind of so-called service. He said something like, Well, I guess we're nearly out of options, but I think the last apartment will meet your needs. I didn't care for his tone or his jokey attitude. When we arrived, I noticed that the exterior of the building looked like it was a bit newer than it was advertised. This real estate agent, seriously. It looked clean, and the realtor let slip that there was a cleaning crew who attended every week. It was way better than I expected. The elevator was modern, the windows, they were sturdy and they looked safe. It was all looking good. Nice clear hallways, nothing piled up. And that was good for us because we used to have this neighbor who would pile all kinds of junk up in the hallway. Anyway, before I'd even looked inside the apartment, I had decided that this was the one. I was getting some seriously good vibes. When I finally got into the apartment, I saw that it had been freshly renovated. It was bright and clean in there. I tried to send my wife a picture of the cooker, since I knew that she was a fan of gas cookers rather than the electric type you often get in apartments. And uh, yeah, she loved the look of the kitchen. Next I saw the closets, they were massive, another tick. I tried to take photos on my phone until it got a little embarrassing, and at that point I gave up. Finally, I saw the balcony, and it looked amazing. It was nice and wide, and I saw myself drinking out there on summer evenings and my wife growing a couple of plants. As I opened the balcony doors and stepped out onto the balcony, I felt something. An intense shiver ran through my body, and then my skin broke out in goosebumps. It was autumn, but it wasn't chilly. In fact, it was a sunny day, and there wasn't any breeze. The feeling I felt was one of fear rather than temperature change. Something wasn't right. I thought to myself, I'm not sure if I like this place. The moment that I thought that, I felt a sudden shove in my back. If it wasn't for the balcony railing, I would have gone tumbling over the edge. We were five floors up, and it could have been fatal. I instinctively turned to glare at the real estate agent, only to see him the other side of the room. He knew something. I knew that he knew something. That was why he was setting me up with all these garbage apartments earlier. He wanted me to pick this one because he knew it would be the last one I saw. And I'd be out of options. He called out to me as if he was expecting it. Are you okay? He asked me if I stumbled onto the threshold of the balcony. We both knew that that wasn't true. I know I didn't trip on anything. I was shoved. I didn't say anything. I mean, what could I say? A moment or two passed and I thought to myself, well, maybe I could have been imagining things. Was I about to turn this dream apartment down because I got goosebumps and potentially tripped over something on the way out to the balcony? I thought about it and I decided to leave the apartment as calmly as possible. When I got outside, I met eyes with another resident on the same floor. It was a young woman. She was married, I saw by the ring. 
She locked eyes with me and shook her head slowly side to side. I swear to God, if I could read minds, I would hear her say, Stay out of there. I headed home to tell my wife about my disappointing and creepy experiences. She was annoyed. She said that we were about to miss our chance for a great apartment. She was really annoyed at me for not snapping it up. I kept telling her that there was something off about the place and that we should keep looking for somewhere better. I started the search for somewhere new immediately, and during my search, I found the website, Oshimateru. Hi, Jay here. Sorry. This website is the one that I used in the introduction. The website allows users to find accident properties or homes with histories. Back to the story. I searched for the apartment that I had visited, and where I felt the shove, and bingo, there it was. Someone had jumped from the balcony, apparently. I showed my wife, and for once, she agreed that I did something good. I feel like we avoided something potentially dangerous. So much for the apartment we wanted.